okay, so uh, yesterday we went over an example of uh, execution of Viterbi algorithm. And the, we have used these equations uh, to fill a table uh, to find the best path uh, which has the highest probability of generating, outputting a certain protein sequence. And we have also talked about uh, whether uh, I mean th these equations, what you write in max here, uh, is determined by the, the Markov model structure, which states could precede uh, the current state you are trying to find. Okay, so uh, so these were the Viterbi equations to find the uh, best path that ends at m u and emitting x i, the first i characters of the sequence. We look at all the states that could have preceded. Uh, this MU, and uh, at those states, we should have ended at the previous character because at state MU, we are emitting the character uh, XI, the ith character of the sequence. Uh, and these uh, states here, MU minus 1, IU minus 1, and DU minus 1, are the states that could have preceded, uh, that have uh, income outgoing arrows that uh, end at state MU. Uh, so, do you have any questions about filling this table? Yes. Uh -huh. So, the question is, uh, when we are filling the table, when, uh, we are, when, when are we going to use this, these equations? Uh, first of all, uh, the, we, so, do we follow a certain order when filling this table? Yes, you should follow a certain order. And these equations tell you actually those or, that order. For example, in order to find VMUXI, you need to know these three things. Okay? Without knowing VMU minus 1, XI minus 1, and VIU minus 1, XI minus 1, and VDU minus 1, XI minus 1, without knowing these three things, you cannot fill in the entry for, for that VMU XI, okay? So the order is determined by these equations. In order to fill in a certain entry, you need to know these three things, okay? So first, you, it, shows you, it tells you that you, first you need to fill in those table cells. Other than that, there is no particular order, okay? So you can, as long as you know, for example, to fill in this VU, you need to find VMU, v, VU at the previous column. So this xi minus 1 uh, refers to the previous column, not uh, because the x sequence is at the columns, okay? Uh, at the top, uh, you have the sequence, and the states are at the rows. So xu minus 1 refers to the previous column. So in order to fill in the entries for iu, xi, you need to know these entries in the previous column, the mu and iu. Uh, in the previous column should have been filled. So uh, as long as the, these are satisfied, you don't, there's no uh, rule that says that you need to first fill in all the, the, the values of, I mean, you, can, you don't need to fill in row by row, okay? You may go any order you want. You may, fill in, you may fill in certain part of the row, and you may start filling the certain column and row. So it's, there is no particular order as long as you know what, uh, as long as uh, you know these previous things, okay? Uh, so these equations tells you what to know before you can fill in that table entry. So is that clear? Mm -hmm. No, also the, also the row orders, it's, that doesn't matter. I mean, there, there is no particular, you can, you can write that row order uh, any way you like. There is no, there is no, implicit order. There's no total order on the set of states. <coughs> I mean, the table, uh, actually, you can even shuffle the columns as well. I mean, it doesn't, the, the table uh, does, is only a visual representation of these equations. You, you don't need to have a table. As long as you can fill in these equations, you can, uh, just you, what you need to do is you need to store them in some place because you are going to be using them to fill in other entries. At the end, what we are interested in is the final uh, v end 
xm. We are interested in that probability, v and xm. You could have written a recursive function, okay? We could have written a recursive function without even filling a table. We can just say that v and uh, xm is equal to these by writing the equations. But what will be the drawback of such a recursive function? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it's, it's going to compute, there's going to be lots of redundant computations because this, if you can see here, this vmu minus one, xi minus one, it's needed also by here, by co computing this. So if you have a recursive function, which is going to uh, f compute these by using these recursive calls, the same value is going to be computed more than once by multiple calls to the same recursive function. This is going to cause a lot of inefficiency. Actually, if you compute this, the number of passes is probably going to be exponential. Okay, so the number of recursive calls, the recursive call tree, uh, at the leaves of these recursive call trees, at the end you are going to find you have exponential number of such computations. You are not going to have a polynomial time algorithm. By filling in the table, what we do is, we remember the, the previous values of these entities. V m u minus one x i minus one, when we compute that, we put it in the table, and we only compute this value once. If uh, we do a recursive function, that the same call is going to be co the same uh, value is going to be computed over and over again by filling in a table. We save that value and we avoid these redundant computations. That's the biggest advantage of dynamic programming algorithm. Okay, filling in this table. Any other questions? So I'm going to uh, finish the uh, Viterbi and the forward by showing uh, just simple extensions to these original equations. Uh, the first extension we are going to do is to take the log of these probabilities because uh, these probabilities are numbers between 0 and 1. Multiplying uh, lots of these small numbers is going to uh, create some, is our probability is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. So. Uh, to avoid certain numerical problems, what we do is we use the log of probabilities instead and convert the products to summation. So the equations become like this. Instead of these multiplications we had, this was the emission probability multiplied this max, we take the log of the emission probability and we take the log of all the numbers here, the transition probability, the probability of the path ending at the previous state, all of them, we take their logs, okay? You can take in log base two or log base 10, it doesn't matter, as long as you know, uh, you, you are consistent with what you're doing. And at the end, if you take these logs, uh, here, uh, A times B, uh, log of A times B is going to be equal to log A plus log B, okay? By making use of uh, this fact, uh, we can just, after taking the log of these indiv individual entities, instead of multiplying these probabilities, we can just uh, sum the logs, okay? So this is what uh, we do. All these uh, equations here are turned to summations, and everything else is the same. And this will, uh, and these logs are going to be uh, negative numbers, since they are smaller than one, okay? We are going to be adding negative numbers, uh, but it doesn't matter as long as uh, at the end you know what you're doing. You are going to be comparing uh, these logs if you're comparing to hidden Markov models with each other. Now, uh, the, another modification to the Viterbi algorithm. So the Viterbi algorithm gives us a single path by tracing back the table we have filled, by tracing back where we, which path we have followed, Meaning, what does it mean? It means that by tracing which of these max, so we are comparing these three entities, which, which of these three entities were the maximum, uh, okay, which of these three entities were the maximum when we were choosing the value for this one, 
okay? By making use of, by putting these uh, in, in some another table maybe, or by tracing back on the fly after filling the table, we can actually find which states we have visited. The maximum of these entities is going to tell us, for example, if the middle one was the maximum one in filling in this table, we'll, we are going to understand that before this MU state, we have visited the IU minus one state. If it was, so this is how we trace back uh, to the beginning of the table. And at the end, after we, uh, we do this trace back, we get ourselves a single path that produces this uh, sequences and it uh, generates uh, the, with the highest probability. Now, if we ask the other question, meaning that what is the probability that this sequence is generated by this HMM? Okay, this is a different question. The probability that this sequence is generated by this HMM is a different question than what the Viterbi answers. Viterbi answers this. What is the probability of the best path that generated this sequence? Okay? The probability of the best path that generated this sequence is different than probability that this HMM has generated this sequence. Because when we ask about that probability, what is the probability that this hidden Markov model generated this sequence, we should consider all the paths find all of their individual probabilities and sum their probabilities to find the overall probability that this HMM generated this sequence. Okay? So the only modification we are going to do is, instead of taking, finding a single path, now we are going to be interested in all the paths which could have generated this sequence. Find all the paths that could have generated this sequence and sum their probabilities. So this is what we do in forward algorithm. So instead of taking the max operation here, all we are going to do is we are going to add all these uh, up, okay? These are going to, uh, be, these are all the possible paths that could lead you to this MUXI. So instead of the max operation, if you just add these three probabilities, uh, you are going to find the summation of all the paths that could have produced your sequence, okay? Th that modification is that simple. Uh, so these are the exact same equations we had for the Viterbi. The only difference is that instead of a max operator for these three entities, now we have the sum, we just sum them up. We are not interested in the best path. All, we just mo uh, accumulate all the probabilities along the paths that could have generated this sequence. All the path probabilities are summed up. This is at the end. The final, uh, again, the bottom rightmost entry is going to give us the overall probability that this HMM has generated this sequence. Okay? Uh, I mean, the if V is changed to F here. Okay? That's just a naming change. Other than that, all these equations are the same. Okay? There is no, so it's, uh, it's the forward probability, the, comp the total probability here we have. Um, again, we can take the logs, similar to what we had done in the Viterbi algorithm. Again, we can take the log of these numbers. Actually, I, I don't show it here. We can take the log of these probabilities and turn these uh, multiplications to summations. And these logs then can be uh, added to each other. But if you're interested in the overall probability, you can leave it like this. Uh, the, if you're interested in the actual probability, uh, you can also leave it without the logs. But, but the only thing we did here is to sum these probabilities up. Now, how are we going to do the trace back in this table? If we, fill in the, if we run the forward algorithm, we have filled in a table, how are we going to find the path? So th this is actually a trick question. <laughs> Because we are, we are not finding a path in forward algorithm, right? If you, since you've added all your options here, all these three probabilities are added, you're not choosing one among them. So there is no question of tracing back. There is, you're, because you're not interested in a single path. So therefore, uh, you don't do a trace back in this table. You just find the probability, and that's all that's, that answers your question. You don't ask the, because the, all the possible paths that could have generated your sequence, the number of all possible paths could be very large. So in that question, you don't want to fi find out all the possible paths that could have generated. You're just interested in the probability in that question. What is the probability that the Markov model generated my sequence? And 
this, this probability is going to be a very small probability, even we sum all these probabilities up. Since a hidden Markov model can generate millions of different sequences, okay, or, or billions of different sequences, a hidden Markov model can generate a variety of, even a single hidden Markov model for a very specific uh, protein family can generate many different sequences if you just r run randomly. And therefore, asking this question, what is the probability that's, that hit this hidden Markov model generate this particular sequence, uh, the probability you are going to get, although, uh, even though this profile, I mean, this protein sequence is much likely produced from this one, the, pro the actual probability that you are going to get is going to be a very small number. Do not expect things like 0 0.3, 0 0.5. It's going to be on the order of 10 to the minus 10, minus 15. It's, it's going to be a very small probability. So by just looking at that probability, it's very difficult to uh, answer whether this protein sequence belongs to that hidden Markov model, it belongs to that family. Okay, because that probability is going to be very small. So why do we even ask this question then? Uh, what is the probability that this uh, sequence is produced by this hidden Markov model? The reason is, uh, if we have multiple models, okay, imagine you have 10 hidden Markov models for 10 different protein sequence families. If you compute these probabilities from all of them, then you can even of even these, uh, the, uh, even if these probabilities are small, you can compare them. And you can say that out of these 10 hidden Markov models, this sequence is most likely to be produced from this particular hidden Markov model. Okay? The, the main, after we compute this forward algorithm, uh, the probability by this forward algorithm, we just use it to compare it against probabilities produced by other hidden Markov models. Okay? So, this is uh, how, what you are going. This is what you are going to do in your assignment. You are going to implement the forward algorithm, okay? Uh, and I'm going to give you uh, five families, five multiple sequence alignments. You are going to generate uh, by using the transition, uh, by using these formulas, by counting the transitions, by using these formulas, okay? The transition probability and the emission probability. You are going to find given a multiple sequence alignment, you are going to create your hidden Markov models for these five families. And I'm going to give you some new sequences, which are not part of the multiple sequence alignment I have given you, some new sequences. And your task is going to be run the forward algorithm on all these five hidden Markov models and find out, predict which family this new sequence belongs to. Of course, you are going to be doing this automatically, as we have seen yesterday, doing it by hand. Uh, maybe you can align two sequences by hand if they're small. I mean, you can, you can fill in a dynamic programming table by 10 by 10 if you're al aligning two sequences. But the hidden Markov models we have seen, I mean, even if you have three, three match states, three match states, you are going to have three insert and three delete states for that. So it's going to be lots of states even for a small sequence. So if I, do, if I say do this for five families, uh, it's going to take a lot long time, a, long, a, a very long time if you're if you going to do it by hand. So therefore, this is going to motivate you to write, I mean, this, we should have a program for it. Okay, so you are going to write a, a program in your preferred language to create the easy Markov models. It may be a separate program, okay, creation of either Markov models given multiple sequence alignments is a separate task. It's like the, the training or model building. You are going to build your models first, and you can save your models in a file if you want, and you are going to write a separate program which can read these models. It doesn't need to look at the multiple sequence alignments anymore. All it needs is these models, and compare a given sequence against, um, against all these models and find which model as produces the highest probability. Okay, so this is what the forward algorithm is. And this is, we can use uh, uh, hidden Markov models to search a database. Okay, so this is what, this is, this looks, I mean, this resembles your assignment. 
So if we are given the, the hidden marker model for a protein family, we can evaluate all the sequences in a database in terms of how likely they could have been produced by this HMM model. And we can use this likelihood score to find new protein sequences as candidate members. So this is like the inverse problem. It is not like given a sequence which protein family it belongs to. This problem on this slide is like the inverse problem. Given a hidden marker model for a single protein family, and you have a database of 7 million protein sequences, for example. Out of these 7 million protein sequences, which could, have been belong, uh, which, which, could be, which could belong to this family, what you do is you can do the same thing, the forward algorithm, for example. All these 7 million sequences could be evaluated on the single HMM. And the ones, the sequences which receive, which pr produce the highest probability, may be candidates of belonging to this particular specific protein family. So this is like a different problem what, than what you're going to do in your assignment. Okay, so we are not, you are not going to implement bound match because we haven't seen that. So given a set of sequences, can, we can find the hidden Markov model without actually performing a multiple sequence alignment. Uh, if, even if we don't have the multiple sequence alignment, bound match algorithm can be used to construct a hidden Markov model. But if we are given a hidden, if we are given a multiple sequence alignment, uh, the creation construction of HMM is going to be much easy. Okay, so I'm going to skip this. We are not going to see uh, Baumwelch algorithm. You can also, uh, to aid in your implementation, there are existing hidden. I mean, I suggest uh, you implement your assignment from scratch because it's not very difficult actually. Or the, 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 if you, if the, the programming assignment, uh, the equations, the Viterbi equations, you're just going to write them in a function and there are no, not many exceptions and also the creation of hidden Markov model is not very difficult. If you try to do it from scratch, I'm sure you'll be able to do it in one or two days. But if uh, there are also existing tools, existing hidden Markov model tools, which uh, builds hidden Markov models given sequences, you can compare your program results with these tools, existing tools, or you can, even some of them are open source, you can try to understand how they are doing the Viterbi algorithm. You can find the Viterbi and uh, forward algorithm source code on the net, okay, if, uh, to help you in this uh, programming. You can use them, okay? Uh, inter you can use any internet sources. I'm not going to consider using internet sources as cheating, but even uh, using them may prove more difficult than doing uh, from scratch because understanding an existing program is also not very easy. Um, so you can look at SAM, uh, Hammer 2, or uh, other uh, tools, see the Markov model tools to help you uh, in your assignment. And in this assignment, I'm also going to give you some examples, okay? So you'll, you'll be able to test your program against these examples as well. I'm going to post it on Monday, okay? I'm going to prepare your uh, assignment this weekend, and your second assignment is going to be available on the web on Monday. Now, we, this is uh, it for the Markov models. We are going to start a new subject now, the multiple alignments. Now, the multiple alignment problem, uh, contrary to the pairwise sequence alignment problem, is a computationally much more difficult problem. It's shown to be MP complete. So there, are, there is no uh, efficient algorithm which can give us the multiple alignment, for example, for 100 protein sequences. Each of them are like 500 amino acids long. If you give it to, I mean, we don't have an algorithm which can compute the optimal multiple alignment among these 100 sequences. It's going to take maybe years to compute these, the, best alignment between them. And of course, this depends on how you define best. Again, we need to define a certain optimization criteria uh, uh, to, to determine what's, what, which are mul good multiple alignments. And multiple alignments actually uh, is one of the most essential tools in molecular biology. Uh, if you have a set of uh, related biological sequences, finding conserved region, sub-regions, or embedded patterns, finding certain patterns in these sequences is done by using multiple sequence alignment. 
and also prediction of protein structure. These are uh, very useful methods since the 1990s. Okay. Now, here's an example of multiple sequence alignment. This is the problem. Given, we are given K sequences. Now, uh, the extension to pairwise alignment is that in pairwise alignment, we were given two sequences, and our goal was to find a matching between these two sequences. Now, we are given a number of, like, we are given K sequences, and our goal is to find the matching between all these K sequences, revealing the shared regions among all. For example, these K sequences are very similar to each other, actually. You can construct a multiple uh, alignment easily by hand. For example, you can see uh, there are important re residues, like the C, the cysteine residue, which is very specific, uh, is, for example, it's going, they're, they're already aligned. Okay? It shows there all the Cs are already on top of each other. This is probably the alignment is going to start, uh, I mean, th this is going to be aligned. However, a couple of, for, them are shorter than the other, for, but this G is at the end, probably it's going to, uh, this G is going to be aligned with this G, and I don't know whether this S is going to be aligned with this S, but our goal at the end is to a multiple sequence alignment of these sequences is to produce an alignment like this. We are going to, by putting gaps in some sequences, uh, we are going to make a column of this alignment as similar as possible. So the, the matching uh, in this, our optimization criteria maybe, produce an alignment in which by inspect all the columns and the scores, a score of a column may be like this. You can use the Blossom 62 matrix again, a scoring matrix, and score each row of this column, each pair of rows in this column with each other, and sum that up. Okay, this is uh, called sum of pair score. So we can compute a score for each column, and the score of a column would be, okay, the score of a column would be for each pair of uh, rows in this column, uh, the score of uh, the ith and jth row with each other the Blossom score, for example. So it's going to uh, be, for example, for this column, look at uh, this, G, 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 G. Uh, the score of this is G against the G, plus G against the G, plus G against the G, plus G against the gap. So all pairwise scores on, for the rows in this amino acids are computed and sum them up. So it's going to give a summed score for that column. And you can, each, you can treat each of these columns independently, and the complete, the overall score of the multiple sequence alignment would be the sum of those column scores. And your goal is to optimize this score. Can you find an alignment in which this score is maximum? And this probably is not the best alignment, because as you can see, these Gs, these three sequences, have Gs at the end, and they are not even aligned with this uh, last column. So probably you can, a better alignment would be to put these Gs at the end. The gaps should not be terminal gaps. You can just uh, replace this gap with this G and put this G at the end, which is probably uh, biologically more true alignment because it shows the Gs at the end are conserved. But here it shows that only the Gs are conserved for the, for the first four sequences. For the last four sequences, there's no G at the end which is not true, actually. So these, these Gs probably are aligned with wrong thing. So after this alignment, what this alignment gives us, a lot of things, it gives us conserved residues, which, are may, which may be functionally important parts of these sequences. Most, most of the time, if you find a multiple sequence alignment for a family of sequences, uh, certain regions of these proteins, they are just, sh I mean, just, they, they will look like random. Okay, nothing is aligned with each other. Those regions may correspond to um, mutated regions which may not be uh, functionally very important. Uh, in, in the evolutionary events, these, if a certain region of a protein is functionally important, 
uh, mutation of that region is not going to be tolerated if it's that important. So therefore, it's conserved through evolutionary uh, events that, that, is, that region is going to be conser conserved. So we can find conserved residues which are shared among all the family members or we can find conserved regions, blocks like this, which are shared among this, a subset of these sequences. For example, this QPPG or, I mean, this, this pattern, Q star PG uh, is, is like a conserved block, uh, conserved uh, region at the end of these four sequences. And also certain patterns in which, okay, this is a conserved column, this is also a conserved column, but in the middle we, we don't care, so it's like V star I or uh, th these may be certain uh, protein, certain type of amino acids, these may be certain type of amino acids. So we can or even try to find some patterns uh, within, so these positions one and three are hydrophobic residues that may have a certain uh, implication, certain meaning. Why is the first and third position are hydrophobic? Okay. And at the end, a multiple sequence alignment gives us these things uh, for a family of sequences. And why is it preferred over pairwise sequence alignment, even if we have pairwise sequence, and pairwise sequence alignment can be done efficiently in polynomial time. So why don't we do the same analysis on pairs of sequences? The answer is that, okay, in, if you have distantly related two sequences, they are distantly related, uh, by just observing a single match in a certain column in this pairwise alignment, it just gives much less evidence, comp I mean, in, I, and you are going to decide whether that region is an important region, right? I mean, you may have lots of matches between pairs, but it just gives you, compare the evidence provided by two sequences about a certain region, compare that with evidence coming from 10 sequences, okay? Me I mean, meaning that region, may be conserved between two of them by chance, okay? Or maybe we, do, we don't see a mutation there, but it doesn't really mean that that region is functionally important. But if you see that conservation among more proteins, 10 proteins, it is going to increase the evidence that this region is an important region is much more likely. So seeing by examining larger number of sequences, you can find uh, there uh, the conserved functional importance size much better. I mean, this shows seeing that an example for uh, here, look at this, the, this, this column, N, N. Uh, if I had compared the first two sequences, I could have come up with the conclusion that, okay, this region, N, N, it's the same, it's aligned between these two sequences, it's a match, so it's a conserved region. However, if you compare the other family members in the same sequence, if you compare 10 of them, none other sequence, no other sequence contains N in that region, okay? So if you compare 10 of them, you see that actually this column, this region is not very well conserved, okay? So, and this higher number of protein sequences is going to give you higher, uh, larger uh, evidence saying which regions are actually functionally important regions. So multiple sequence alignment is really an important tool for molecular biologists. Any, any questions? So, uh, now the most of the multiple sequence alignment algorithms, uh, they work under the assumption that they are aligning uh, sequences from the same family or there are certain functional relationships between these uh, sequences you are aligning. Uh, if you're not giving them uh, related sequences, they are also, the algorithms try to align those sequences as well. And sometimes the garb they, they may produce garbage results if they're aligning things that are unrelated, okay? If the alignment looks wrong, it, the reason may be the sequences you're trying to align are not functionally related at all. So these are some warnings about multiple sequence alignment. And I'm going to actually now skip certain parts of this uh, multiple sequence alignment slides because I want to speed up. Uh, here, what I want to tell you about multiple sequence alignment is that the first thing, I mean, the first part of the slides show that uh, it's a difficult problem. Finding the actual optimal alignment is going to require exponential time. 
we need uh, exponential in the number of sequences we are aligning. Uh, for example, imagine we were filling a two-dimensional table when aligning two sequences. For aligning three sequences, we will be filling three three-dimensional table. So you can actually uh, write a dynamic programming algorithm which compare three sequences by filling in a cube, uh, like a three-dimensional matrix instead of a 2D matrix. And as the number of sequences increases, then the dimensionality of this matrix is going to increase which is going to exponentially, uh, dimensionality grows. Uh, for example, uh, in a table, you have uh, three neighbors, but in a cube, you are going to have seven neighbors. In a four-dimensional thing, you are going to have much more, maybe uh, uh, 40 or 50 neighbors in a four-dimensional cube. Okay, so the number of neighbors that you are going to be looking for when filling in this dynamic programming table is going to increase exponentially as you're filling in this table. Therefore, writing a dynamic programming solution for multiple sequence alignment is going to be very difficult. It's going, you can write it, but you can, it's going to be very uh, computationally expensive to fill in the table. Therefore, there are heuristics. There are algorithms which does not guarantee optimality, but works on the assumption that it's a good idea that can give you a good alignment. Uh, and there's one such algorithm, which is the most popular one, is the Clustal W. Clustal W algorithm is uh, one of the most popular multiple sequence alignment uh, tools. There are other ones like tea, coffee, and muscle. They are also uh, gaining popularity. And these work on the, uh, they, they, they do not try to f run a dynamic programming uh, solution, but they start building alignments they are called progressive multiple sequence alignment builders. Starting from pairwise alignments, they add a new sequence to the pairwise alignment one by one and try to grow a multiple sequence alignment. And of course, uh, the quality of such an alignment which progressively builds, uh, the quality of that alignment depends much uh, on the order of the sequ pairwise sequence alignments you are doing. For example, imagine you started your alignment by comparing the most distant sequences pairwise. If you compare the most distant sequences pairwise, you are most likely going to do some errors during this matching because they are very different. If there are two sequences which are not so highly similar to each other, uh, you may even in you are finding an optimum pairwise alignment, you can make wrong decisions about choosing the matches of these amino acids. And this wrong decision, when you are adding the third sequence, you will not be able to undo your decisions because after you fix the first pairwise sequence alignment, uh, uh, you cannot go back and change it because if you can go back and change everything, it's again, it's going to, the computational co complexity of this going back and changing, it's going to increase your uh, running time a lot. So after you do this pairwise alignment, you don't go back and fix it. And therefore, if you started with, a two, se with two sequences which are distantly related, and you have done errors in this alignment, this er these errors are going to propagate to the end of the multiple sequence alignment, which is going to lead to a very wrong multiple sequence alignment. So therefore, the order of pairwise alignments when you're building this multiple sequence alignment is very important. What Clustal W uses is that, what we call as a guide tree, uh, it first analyzes these, uh, all your sequences that you want to align and finds out which ones are close to each other, the groups of uh, sequences that are close to each other. So it builds actually a tree, like a, a tree of life, okay? We can, it's, it may be a binary tree, okay? And this tree shows us that, for example, if you are going to align six sequences, this one, this such a tree shows us that these two sequences are similar to each other. These two sequences are similar to each other. These two sequences are similar to each other. So first, when you're going to do the pairwise alignment, when you're, if you're going to align all these six together, first align these pairs, and then the, first align these three pairs, and then combine these two pairs 
together. This one shows that these two pairs are closer to each other than this first pair because this, the tree shows us that, okay? In the tree, these two are grouped together first and they are matched with this uh, thing. So this such kind of a tree is going to give us the order of pairwise alignments we are going to be doing. And this is how cluster W works actually. It's, it first constructs such a tree of relationships between all the sequences that uh, we are trying to align. And then starts from pairwise alignments and progressively uh, combines these. So how are we going to combine these alignments? We need to have ways to, for example, if I align this and if I align these two, the alignment is going to be a certain thing. We are going to have an alignment. For example, certain alignment regions are matched. For example, there may be mismatches in these alignments. Okay? Then if I, after I have two alignments, I need to have a way to align two alignments to get a, another alignment. I need to have a way to combine two pairwise alignments to have a new alignment. And actually, we have uh, seen uh, ways to do that. If I represent these, each column as a distribution of amino acids at that position. We have seen, you, know, you remember the profile representation, the position specific matrices and uh, the first, before we started the hidden Markov models, we have seen how we can uh, represent an alignment by a single sequence. And if we, after representing it as a single sequence, we can use dynamic programming actually to combine them uh, to generate another alignment. So the, the slides, this is, I summarized the slides actually. Um, so the classal W, uh, apart from that, there are other heuristics that could have been used. Uh, one such heuristic is the star alignment. And you are going to see star alignment is also a progressive alignment algorithm. What it does is, it doesn't use such a guide tree, but its goal is, if I'm given K sequences, out of these, in, in these K sequences, is there a, se find the sequence which is uh, close to every other protein in this sequence of K. So it's like, find the central uh, protein sequence, which is not going to be far away from any of these uh, protein sequences in the list. Okay, yes. So in star alignment, the goal is given a K sequences to align, multiply align, finding, for the, the first thing of star alignment is finding a central sequence, which is not going to be distant from any of the remaining K, or I mean, it can be distant. Our goal is to find the one compared to all the other K, uh, other Ks, find the one which is uh, close to all the other uh, K, K proteins. So it's like as, asking, it's like this. If you are in, a, in this class, for example, well, our goal is to find the student who is, who is going to have most friends in this. Uh, it's like, a, I mean, for example, there may be groups of students in the, in the class. But there may be a hub student who knows uh, people in the other group as well. So there may be a single student who, who, is, who is friends with some uh, other students in this friendship clique and also knows some other people in this friendship clique. So there may be such a student who knows everybody in this class. So this is going to be our central uh, sequence uh, in the uh, um, star alignment finding such a, uh, su such a protein sequence, which is not far away from it. So this and star alignment starts with the central protein sequence and aligns all the other sequences one by one to the central one. The pairwise alignment grows like this. So I'm going to now go over, it's going to be much clearer if I go over the slides. And the first, first thing is that shows, I'm going to skip over this quickly, is that it shows how uh, we can generalize the notion of dynamic programming alignment uh, to three sequences. And at, at the end, if we align three sequences using a dynamic programming matrix, we are going to be filling a three-dimensional uh, table instead of a two-dimensional table. And here is the, in the 2D alignment matrix, we have a path here in the 3D alignment matrices. And also our, the number of neighbors to fill in a certain 
three-dimensional matrix cell, we will be looking at seven neighbors. There will be seven neighbors and uh, that which correspond to this. If you're going to fill in this IJK, there is this I minus one, no, where is that one? Yeah, I minus one, J minus one, K minus one, okay? It's like this. If you're going to match, so if you're going to fill in the table entry, uh, okay, you are going to have, you have, you have three sequences, and you are at i, j, k. So you can either align all of them. You, you may have three mismatches or three matches, okay? You can align all of them. Imagine we have sequences like this, A, A, C, okay? The i, j, k letters in the sequence are A, A, C. So you can have A, A, C, you can have gap A, C, okay? You can have A, gap C, you can have so these, these uh, neighbors shows all the possibilities you can have for the next alignment position. So it shows you that uh, it's, uh, you have much more neighbors compared to the 2D alignment. 2D alignment, we had only three choices. That could have, I mean, either match, either gap against the first one or gap against the second one. These were our three choices. Now our choices increase. Uh, we can have different gaps. We can have also two gaps. We can have A uh, like this, C, sorry, C. So the number of gaps can be one or two, the number of matches. So, and this, this increases the number of neighbors in such a uh, three-dimensional cell. And our DP recurrence relation becomes like this, okay? Seven of them. Uh, actually, you can e easily code this to have a multiple sequence alignment for three sequences. So three alignment of three sequences. And here for three sequences of length n, the running time is going to be seven n cube. Okay, since we're filling in a, a table of a three dimensional cube. So n by n by n matrix. The size of the cube is going to be n cube. And to fill in each table cell, we have seven options that we are considering. So for each table cell, we are going to be seven operations. So seven n cube operations are going to be needed to fill in this table. And in big O notation, uh, it's, it's going to be O n cube. And if you generalize this to k sequences, okay, this is the formula for k sequences. This is two to, our number of choices actually is going to be two to the k minus one. So this number three and number seven are not just arbitrary numbers. They're actually, this three is two to the two minus one. Actually, minus one is here, sorry, yeah. Two to the uh, two minus one. We are comparing two sequences, two to the two, four minus one, three. If you're comparing three sequences, two to the three minus one, it's going to be seven. And this, this tells you that if you're comparing 10 sequences, okay? Now, let's see how this one, for, 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 by just comparing these two, three and seven, it seems like a linear growth, right? I mean, you just, it just doubled, <laughs> like, but if you do it for 10 sequences, it's going to be two to the 10 minus one, which is going to be 1,023. So if you, uh, I mean, as you can see how quickly it grows, uh, if you're going to write a dynamic programming algorithm to compare 10 sequences, 10 is not a very big number, okay? 10, 10 sequences, multiple align 10 sequences. In your ifs, you need to have 1,000 if statements to fill in, a, fill in a single table cell, okay? You need to compare 1,023 uh, neighbors. Uh, this, this is how many uh, gaps, different gaps and uh, alignments, uh, matches you can have. And the conclusion is that the dynamic programming approach for alignment, and, and therefore you can understand how difficult it is going to be to compare uh, 100 to, it doesn't scale to 100 sequences, 2 to the uh, 100 minus 10, and n to the 100. So this is a very, very large number. So you cannot uh, basically use dynamic programming to align a uh, large number of sequences. So it's impractical. Uh, due to exponential running time. And here, uh, the notion, the idea of progressing alignment 
comes from the fact that if we are given a multiple sequence alignment, if somebody gives you a multiple sequence alignment like this, right? So this is a, this is a multiple sequence alignment computed by some program. Now, this multiple sequence alignment actually induces pairwise alignments. So it implicitly states pairwise alignments between each pairs of rows. Okay, if this multiple sequence alignment says that, the, the way to pairwise align this and this is just by looking at these rows, it's, it's also an alignment, okay? Take any, any two rows, it's also a pairwise alignment. Now, the question is that, is it the optimal pairwise alignment? <laughs> Probably not, because uh, the something pairwise optimal, uh, if it was the case, if we, we could just do n square pairwise alignment, so we could do just uh, in, in n to the 4 time, we could actually, uh, sorry, it's a k, k times n to the 4 time, okay? In k n to the 4 time, we could actually align uh, any, we could do multiple sequence alignment. So how, how did I find this? It's like this. Uh, if, uh, sorry, it's like, I, I did this wrong. It's k cube n square, right? Yeah. It's, uh, if, imagine uh, you have k sequences. Imagine you have k sequences. Each of them are length n. Uh, how many pairs of uh, sequences you are going to have here? k square. Actually, it's uh, k times uh, k minus 1 divided by 2. Okay, this is the actual number. Uh, but uh, you can just say in all notation, it's k square. Okay, so this is the number of pairs of sequences you have. Uh, for each of them, if you pairwise align them using dynamic programming, you are going to have, uh, this is going to be your running time, one square coming from each of these pairwise alignments, and you do these pairwise alignments k square times. And, and uh, the other thing is, you are going to, yeah, actually, this, where did this uh, other k came from? Actually, it's just uh, k square n, I guess. If you do this, and then you need to, if you do this, this is going to, it's going to take this much time uh, to pairwise align all of them. And if in the multiple sequence alignment, if we had all these induced pairwise alignment optimal, it means that if you just put these optimal alignments on top, on top of each other, what you're going to get yourself is a multiple sequence alignment. However, the situation is that an optimal, uh, uh, an induced alignment by a multiple sequence alignment for, between these two pairs of sequences may not actually be the optimal pairwise alignment between these sequences. Optimal alignments may be conflicting with each other. Okay, when you're going to build a multiple sequence alignment, an optimal alignment between these two sequences may be conflicting with other optimal alignment between uh, this sequence and another sequence. Meaning that uh, if you have three sequences, imagine you have three sequences, A, B, C. In these two sequences, this may say that, okay, the fifth position is aligned with this fifth position. Okay? These, in the pairwise alignment between A and B, we may say that fifth position is aligned with fifth, fifth position. And this one say, may say that, okay, uh, the fifth position is aligned again with fifth position, okay? These BC and AB, pairwise alignment, they all say fifth positions are aligned with the fifth position. But if you align A and C together, it may say that my fifth position is in the optimal alignment is aligned with the seventh position. So what are you going to do now? There's a conflict. So the pairwise alignments may actually... Uh, conflict with each other where, when uh, you are going building this multiple sequence alignment. And we are going to uh, take, account, take into account these things when we are building uh, the progressive alignment. But now let's have a break and continue uh, after the break about the progressive alignment techniques. <laughs>